John J. Myers, the Libertarian Party candidate for the United States Senate representing Texas. If y'all would please give it up for uh, John J. Myers. You know, the interesting thing about going to Libertarian events is the fact that when you get in there and you start talking to people, most of the people in the room can answer the question that they ask you better than you can answer the question yourself. <laughs> and it, it makes coming to these events kind of kind of fun, but at the same time, it's kind of weird because I kind of get the stump speech that I give to everybody else. And for instance, uh, two days ago, I went to go to a Green Party event, and uh, there, there, Actually, that was yesterday. I went to a Green Party event. Now, you lose track of time on these things. So I, I went to a Green Party event, and I did that. I gave the exact same speech that I'm about to give to you, and that I've given to libertarians all across Texas. And do you know what the result was? The result was everyone there came up and shook my hand. There were people asking for yard signs, people asking for T-shirts, people doing this. It's the same. You know why? Because it, the politicians on the left and the right try to divide people. But when you talk about what's really wrong with America, you unite people. And that's what I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you. So I'm gonna basically give you guys the stump speech. It's the stump speech that I want you to realize that I'm gonna be giving to a lot of people across Texas, not just libertarians, and I hope you kind of, I hope you like it. One of the things I like to talk about is, when, is a story I tell called Stop Stealing My Stuff, and it's very simple, and it's what's wrong with America. You wake up in the middle of the night because you hear a crashing sound downstairs. You go downstairs, and you see a guy standing there with your television set. So obviously, obviously you're upset. And so the first thing that you're going to say to that guy who's on your TV is, what religion are you? <laughs> Wait a minute. The first thing that, that you're going to say to that guy is, what's your stance on gay rights? No, the first thing that you're going to say to that guy is, stop stealing my stuff. And that's where we are today. We've got the government splitting everybody in groups, as I said, and there's, all they're doing is get, they're putting one side on one side, <coughs> one side of you on one side, one side of you on the other side, and then they're just stuffing bags full of money and handing it to their friends while you guys sit there and fight. <laughs> and that's what, that's what we've done in America. Now, the reason I'm running, I'll tell you what. In 2007, I was kind of, I was running my own business, I had my own money. And... I love Ron Paul, libertarianism, but I was the guy on the couch. You know, at night I watched CNN, I was addicted to CNN and, and the news network, networks. But I never did anything. And then one day, I saw Ron Paul up on stage, and he was, he was debating, there was eight of them up there. And one of them was Rudy Giuliani. And Rudy Giuliani said, terrorists hate us for our freedom. The same, and, and I noticed all eight of them believed this, except for Ron Paul. And then Ron Paul, being timid, a lot more timid than I am, said, well, you know, they, it's wrong, and, you know, they do not hate us for our freedom. And everybody seemed like he was crazy. And at that time I said, I have to do something. Because that's not crazy, that's common sense. I mean, if you believe that terrorists hate us because we're free... You should not be allowed to serve in public office. You should maybe serve in a mental institution. You may have to wear a rubber mat on your head to keep you from doing harm to yourself or others. That's what happens if you believe that terrorists hate us because we're free. Terrorists do not hate us because we're free. Terrorists hate us because we're in their country installing puppet dictators, stealing their resources, and forcing democracy to the barrel of a gun. That is why terrorists hate us. <laughs> $1.1 trillion being the world's police, and our army is the equivalent of the next 16 armies put together. Who are we geared up to fight? Space aliens? What would be the point? What are you going to do with a $2 billion battleship to stop a guy from putting a bomb in his underwear? How is that going to work? Shouldn't you just think, why is that guy putting a bomb in his underwear? That would be the key. And when you have an entire political class that does not understand what is going around the world and why these people feel the way they do about it, you're never going to solve that problem. Another thing I'd like to talk about is corporatism in America. And you all know what that is. You know, you don't have to explain that to libertarians. Because libertarians, unfortunately, have to, have, have to explain to people that what we have in America right now is not capitalism. What we
we have in America right now is not a free market. We don't have these things, but everybody believes that we do. And then people from the left will pin the problems that we have on the free market. And the Republicans are just idiots. <laughs> that pretend that they're going to do something, but they never do. When they have the opportunity to do something, they don't do it. Now, in the latest Republican primary, you know, normally in Texas, now I realize there's a slight chance that I might not win, but they had the, they had the Republican primary, and the battle was between David Dewhurst and Ted Cruz. David Dewhurst, an oil and gas guy who used to work for the CIA, <laughs> and Ted Cruz, whose wife is in the CFR, he's worth, she works, she's a vice president of Goldman Sachs, and he worked for Bush's domestic policy, and he was the political outsider. <laughs> so the political outsider, upstart Tea Party guy, you know, gets the full momentum of the Tea Party behind him, when in fact this guy is as political insider as you get. <coughs> so in this battle royal, it was the banks versus the oil companies, and the banks won. But if I had told you that those were the two characters in this play, like I was going to write a story about politics, and I was going to say one's a CIA oil and gas guy, and the other guy's Goldman Sachs, you'd go, oh man, you can't use that, that's too cliche. <laughs> you can't use those characters in your novel? That is too cliche. So, <clears throat> anyway, the, uh, oh boy, I hate not having my notes. But the, uh, but the other thing, uh, that man, one of the main reasons that uh, I am running, now Ted Cruz and MF winning, and we've got to do something about it. We've got word to spread that we've got a message that would appeal to the Tea Party. Because how did the Tea Party start? What, how did the Tea Party get its start? Really? Well, yeah. But it was what fired up that entire thing? It was the bailouts. It was the bailouts, right? Everybody was mad about the bank bailouts. And then how did Occupy get, get it started? The banks. So both of these things that we talked about, on the left and the right, were both mad about what? The Barney. banks. And now we've got people like Paul Ryan, Eric Cantor, John Boehner, Pete Sessions, Mitch McConnell. These guys are the heroes of the Tea Party. The heroes. These guys all voted for the bailouts. <laughs> what world do we live in where these guys who all vote for the bailouts, the stimulus, TARP, the Patriot Act, NDAA, these are the heroes of the Tea Party? How is that possible? But the Tea Party doesn't even seem to know that. So is it the news channels that bring... Okay, don't answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously it is the news channels. We have to be our own news channel. We have to get our own information out there. We have to share the information about our candidates and Gary Johnson so people know that there is a different choice. One of the main reasons that I'm running for office, besides the other two main reasons that I'm running for office, is that I'm a libertarian. I believe that you should be able to live your life as you see fit. You should be able to eat, drink, or smoke whatever it is that you want. You should be able to marry whoever you want. It's not my business to tell you what to do. It's not government's business to tell you what to do. And those are the kind of things that I'd be fighting for. I have a little story that I like to tell. I was sitting outside of my bar, and I was having the argument that you guys have had with someone about marijuana before. And we kept going around, and I said, well, do you realize with the legalization of hemp, popular mechanics called it the $80 billion cash crop. Yeah, that was 1937. <laughs> you know, you can make oil and fabrics, you can make clothes, you can make plastics, you can just grow it, you'd have to smoke a house of it to get high, but somehow we made it illegal. And I tell the guy this, and he says, it doesn't matter. Marijuana makes you hungry, stupid, and lazy. <laughs> All right? Well, do you realize that it costs $40,000 a year to lock someone up for smoking pot, and then we have to pay this, and you have to pay this, and you care so much. I mean, hand me your wallet. Because you care so much about this guy, you want to keep him in jail so he doesn't smoke pot on his couch. Is that how it, it doesn't matter because marijuana makes you hungry, stupid, and lazy. <laughs> and I, we went back and forth. Okay, I've had it, I've had it. 
So you're telling me that we have had a 40-year war against hungry, stupid, lazy people, and we can't win it. <laughs> I think it's time. I think it's time to throw in the ground. If I was a, if I was a general here, you are like, General, we give you a choice. You can fight anyone you want. Space aliens, Romans, countrymen, whoever. Whoever you want to fight. I would be like, hungry, stupid, lazy. <laughs> that is my choice. That is who I'd like to fight. So, we, when we were in Austin, we met a girl at Brave New Books. And I was talking to her, and she was a big Ted Cruz fan. She'd never heard of me in her life. And she was down there, and she said, first thing she said to me was, well, do you think you can win? And I said, well, let me talk to you. So I pretty much had a little bit of the same conversation that we just had. I'm not sure this is a conversation. I spewed words at you in the same way that I'm doing now. But I, I we had a little, told, told her a little bit about myself the same way that I've, I've talked to you guys. And what she said at the end was, you were awesome. I can't believe it. I can't believe I was ever in Ted Cruz's camp. I can't believe I even thought about it. I didn't even know you exist. Give me a bumper sticker. Give me a sign. I'll put it in my yard. We'll do whatever we can for you. And I was like, great, fantastic. Oh, by the way, you know that question? The question you asked? Can I win? I just did. Because every time that we spread a message that's the message that I'm talking to you guys about, every time that we win one more person over... We win. We all win. Libertarian Party wins. Every time Gary Johnson gets someone to go, I get it. So whenever we donate to Gary Johnson, whenever you donate to the Libertarian Party, whenever you donate to me, you're putting people out there that people might say, I get it. I see what's wrong. And then we win. Maybe that's a little win. But with a collection of little wins and people whose minds have been won over to the idea that the two-party system is completely broken, then we'll actually start winning elections. People like Sterling Russell, who is awesome, by the way. People like Sterling Russell will, could possibly get elected with enough support from you guys. Sterling Russell can get elected. Because the state rep race, make sure I got it right. Yes, I knew I had that. But the state rep race, that's a winnable race. With enough people door knocking, it's a winnable race. You can do something. Sometimes there's a slight chance, slight chance, everybody, that I might not. Slight chance. But along the way, I win every day. And along the way, it's winning for us. Last thing that I want to leave you with, because they won't let me introduce Gary Johnson. <laughs> because every time, every time that I try to introduce Gary Johnson, I get so excited. Because I've seen his resume, I know what he's all about, and I exaggerate. He has not laid the hammer down more times than this. <coughs> <laughs> he did not find Mount Everest with no lands. <laughs> so they stopped allowing me to introduce him, but I want to leave you with this. There are people out there that say that libertarians are extreme. Okay? I am not extreme. It's not extreme to believe that spending $1.1 trillion a year to be the policeman of the world. It's not extreme to think that our president shouldn't be allowed to kill people without a trial. It's not extreme to think that we shouldn't have bailed the banks out to a tune of $26 trillion, as reported by the Wall Street Journal, but no one seems to know. It's not extreme to think any of these things. I am not extreme. Our government is extreme. For the moment y'all been waiting for, a man who needs no introduction, Governor Gary Johnson. like all of you to know that uh, I have been an entrepreneur my entire life. Uh, since I've been 17 years old, I've paid for everything that I've had in my life. When I was 17, I started working construction jobs because those were the highest paying jobs. When I was a junior in college, uh, I started a one-man handyman business in Albuquerque, uh, me. And I grew that business to over a thousand employees in 20 years, in 1994. It's amazing what happens when you show up on time, when you do what you say you'll do for people, when you do a little bit more than what you say you'll do for people. 
And it was very high tech, uh, electrical, mechanical, plumbing, pipe fitting, architects, engineers. I sold that business in 1999. Uh, nobody lost their job, and it allows me to have a full-time unpaid job running for President of the United States. I had never been involved in politics prior to running for Governor of New Mexico. Complete outsider. I went and I introduced myself to the Republican Party two weeks before I announced my candidacy for governor. What they said was, wow, we really like you. We like you, we like what you've got to say. You know, we're an inclusive party, so we're going to make you a part of this entire process. You can be part of the debates, the discussions, the meetups. You know, we're an open group here. But you just need to know that you will never get elected that it's not possible to come from completely outside of politics and get elected governor in a state that's two to one Democrat. Well, I got elected. I'd like to think it was based on what I had to say, which was I was going to bring a common sense business approach to state government. Best product, best service, lowest price. Isn't that what government can provide? Can't government create, uh, can't government provide a level playing field for all of us? I distinguished myself, I think, nationally in a number of categories, but one of them was I may have vetoed more legislation as governor of New Mexico than the other 49 governors in the country combined. I vetoed 750 bills while I was governor of New Mexico. I had thousands of line item vetoes as governor of New Mexico. I took line item veto to a new art form. It made a difference when it came to billions of dollars worth of spending. It made a difference when it came to laws that, in my opinion, were just going to add time and money to you and I having to comply with those laws. It wasn't going to make us any safer. It wasn't going to make us any more healthy. It was just going to add time and money. I vetoed that legislation, and I always wrote uh, a veto message. I think the ultimate arbiter of whether or not that was good or bad was in a state that was two to one Democrat. Uh, I got reelected by a bigger margin the second time than the first time. I just think it speaks volumes to the fact that people really do appreciate good stewardship of tax dollars. I joke about this, but it's true. In New Mexico, people wave at me with all five fingers, not just one. <laughs> My favorite bill that I vetoed was a dog and cat exercise bill that but for my signature would have been law in New Mexico. It was a Republican bill. I was an equal opportunity vetoer, by the way. Two thirds of the legislature was Democrat, one third of the legislature was Republican. A third of the bills I vetoed were Republican bills. Unofficially, I vetoed 100 bills that the legislature put out where the vote in the legislature was 117 to zero, and I vetoed the legislation and it got sustained. And I took on the debate and the discussion that went along with the fact that the sky was going to fall and the world was going to end. Well, it didn't end and the sky didn't fall. But back to the dog and cat exercise bill. <laughs> a Republican bill comes to my desk. A bill requiring pet stores to exercise their dogs and cats two hours a day, three times a week. On my veto message, I said, this is a great idea. This is a terrific business practice. But this should be a business practice. This shouldn't be a law, because if I sign this into law, the next thing I'm going to have to do is fund the dog and cat exercise police. <laughs> I am the libertarian nominee for president of the United States. I think what's very significant is there are only going to be three candidates on the ballot in all 50 states, Barack Obama, Mitt Romney, and myself. There are other third-party candidates, but none of them are going to come close to 50-state ballot access. So when I talk about my opponents here, I'm talking about Mitt Romney and Barack Obama. I am the only candidate running that doesn't want to bomb Iran. I'm the only candidate running that wants to get out of Afghanistan tomorrow and bring the troops home. I'm tired of our military intervention with unintended consequence. The unintended consequence is we have hundreds of millions of enemies to this country that but for our military interventions we would otherwise not have. 
And I'm tired of politicians that beat their chests and, and have our military intervene at a cost of tens of thousands of lives, innocent lives, in the foreign countries that we're in, and results in our men and service women coming back in body bags or with their limbs blown off. As President of the United States, that's not going to be my what I leave in my way. I'm the only candidate that would not have signed the National Defense Authorization Act allowing for detainment and arrest without being charged. This is why we fought wars. I'm the only candidate that wants to repeal the Patriot Act. I'm the only candidate that wants to end the drug wars now. I'm the only candidate talking about marriage equality from the standpoint of it being a constitutionally guaranteed right on par with civil rights of the 60s. I am the only candidate that believes we need to balance the federal budget now, not 30 years from now, but now. And balancing the federal budget now means cutting $1.4 trillion worth of spending from our budget now. And if we don't do it, we're going to find ourselves in the midst of a monetary collapse. What's a monetary collapse? It's when the dollars in our pocket don't buy a thing because of the ensuing inflation that goes along with borrowing and printing money to the tune of 43 cents out of every dollar we spend. It means addressing the entitlements, Medicaid, Medicare. Social Security is really a problem that is pale in comparison to all of this. Social Security is absolutely savable. It's about cutting the military by 43%. It's about saying, yes, we need a strong military defense. We need a strong national defense. Defense, though, here is the operative word, not offense and not nation building. I am the only candidate advocating abolishing the income tax, corporate tax, and the IRS, and replacing all of this with one federal consumption tax, in this case I am embracing the fair tax, which if you look at it, ends up to be cost neutral over a very short amount of time. It's really the answer when it comes to our exports, bleeding out the 23% embedded tax that we have, non-transparent taxes that we have in goods and services that we export. So it's the answer when it comes to China. It's really the answer when it comes to jobs. In a zero corporate tax rate environment, if the private sector doesn't create tens of millions of jobs, I don't know what it takes to create tens of millions of jobs. Woo! There is a big, big difference here between myself and the other candidates. I'd like to point out some things that uh, have occurred uh, during this presidential cycle. Uh, one is uh, the ACLU a group dedicated to civil liberties, a group dedicated to the first ten amendments of the Constitution, they came out with a report card on all the presidential candidates. And this is really important. Mitt Romney and Rick Santorum out of, by the way, 24 Liberty Torches was a perfect score. Mitt Romney and Rick Santorum, zero Liberty Torches out of 24. <laughs> Newt Gingrich, four Liberty Torches out of 24. Barack Obama, 16 Liberty Torches out of 24. Ron Paul, 18 Liberty Torches out of 24. Gary Johnson, 21 Liberty Torches out of 24. They also did a study on which presidential candidate had the best record when it came to jobs. <laughs> My reply to that was the same as it was when I was governor of New Mexico. I didn't create a single job as governor of New Mexico, but I did create an environment where the private sector operated with certainty. I appointed the heads of all the agencies. I appointed the boards and commissions. I controlled all rules and regulations, and rules and regulations got better on a daily basis with just a root in common sense. If rules and regulations were going to cause us to have to spend more time and more money complying with rules and regulations that weren't going to make us any safer, weren't going to make us any more healthy, why have them? Made a really, really big difference. 
I would not be standing here before you right now if there was not the opportunity to win. The only way that I win, though, is if I am in the national debates against Obama and Romney. And to get there, I need to poll at 15%, and I need to be registered to run or be on the ballot in enough states so that I could, can get enough electoral votes. Well, I can get enough electoral votes, and right now only three of the 18 polling organizations uh, that are national are including my name. And let me tell you, right now I'm polling anywhere from a low of 5% to a high of 23%, depending on when the poll was conducted and in which state. But let me tell you what would happen tomorrow uh, if in Houston, if in the paper it reported that Gary Johnson is at 5% of the national vote. What would happen would be, who the hell is Gary Johnson? Yeah. That's what would happen. Yeah. And what that would do is it would drive a lot more people to the website, it would drive a lot more people to look at my resume and recognize that not only am I talking about the problems and the solutions that go along with the problems, but I have a resume to suggest that there is nothing in my resume, nothing in my resume to suggest that I am not going to doggedly pursue these agendas that I'm talking about. They polled in Arizona, good news, bad news, they polled in Arizona about six weeks ago. Uh, Bad news, 80% of Arizonans don't know who I am. Of the remaining 20%, half of them are going to vote for me. So, I am really heartened by this campaign. All right? We've got an A team. I have an A team. We're putting out a terrific product on a daily basis, and anything is possible. If there is anything that this election has taught us over the last since it started is, is it's about a 17-day cycle. I think there have been six Republicans at the top of the heap for about 17 days until the whack-a-mole process takes place. So one of the big fears I have is peaking too early. All this has to, all this has to do is take effect in the middle of October, and this is very, very possible. But something else I really recognize is that every one of you, if given the opportunity, would be doing what I'm doing right now. But I've been given this opportunity. I'm, try I'm trying to make the best of it. Ron Paul and I, I believe, are basically talking about the same message. Here in a couple of weeks, Ron, Paul, Ron Paul's candidacy is going to officially come to an end, and who then becomes the spokesperson for liberty and freedom? Well, it would be the libertarian nominee for president. And that happens to be me. So I take this role very, very seriously. This country is in deep, deep trouble, and it's going to require mutual sacrifice on all of our parts if we're going to right the ship. Thank you all for your activism. Thank you for being here this evening. Um, I would also like to point out that there is a website, isidewith.com. How many of you have seen it? isidewith.com. If you write it down, write it down. Get online. I side with. You answer 36 questions. It's easy. It only takes about five minutes. 1.4 million Americans have done this to this point. You answer the questions, and at the end, it pairs you up with the candidate most in line with your views. Based on the 1.4 million people who have taken this test, I'm the next president of the United States. So. Speaking with a broad brushstroke, I think the majority of Americans in this country are fiscally responsible and socially accepting. Where is the representation to that? Democrats have failed us when it comes to dollars and cents, and you know what? They failed us when it comes to civil liberties. Republicans are horrible on civil liberties, and they failed us when it comes to dollars and cents. We have a $16 trillion debt. Eight and a half trillion of that is the responsibility of Democrats. Seven and a half trillion of that is the responsibility of Republicans. Tell me how a vote is wasted by voting your conscience and voting for someone who will actually make a difference. Isn't voting for someone who isn't going to make a difference, who's the lesser of two evils, isn't that throwing away your vote? So yeah. what I'm asking everybody to do, what I'm asking everybody to do 
is just ask your friends to give this a look. That's all. Ask your friends to get online, isidewith.com, take the test. And by the way, you could be a homeless person and identify the problems that exist in this country. You could be a homeless person and identify the solutions that need to go along with the, with the problems that we have. Apparently Romney and Obama can't do the second, but a homeless person could. <laughs> but a homeless person can't run for president of the United States. You have to have a resume to do that. And I want to suggest to you that there's no give here. There's no give here. There's no stop in what we're doing. And that's the investment that you're making here, is an investment in somebody who won't stop, who won't give up, and will continue to articulate, to argue, to debate, and discuss all of these issues. Thank you very, very much.